a lot of aspects that needed to be added to this. But I, I think for their, their short answer was that we're trying to keep it simple. But I was trying to argue it's not a simple problem, it's not a simple issue, <laughs> so it's going to be made from the market place. But yeah, I definitely appreciate that feedback, and, and part, part of what I hope to do is all continue to, to battle at it, as you said, to make these suggestions, to make it a more holistic model. And I, I should just add that uh, this is a model that's it's basically built out what, what was developed in, in, by CARE. It's essentially a, a livelihood assessment here, you can see, and it looks at uh, livelihood strategies. It sort of was built upon that. And again, that also did not have this question of sustainability on that, that either. And I, I think that in translating that over, I, I think that I agree needs to be added. But if you sort of look historically at this model from CARE and what CRS developed, it's very similar. And I, I agree, it needs to be added to, absolutely. I'm, I'm glad you recognize the same problem. You've got more influence than I do, so that's a, that's a positive. Well, I'll, I'll just try to keep talking about it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, in, in response can, to can we get, oh, there's a line of people over here. Oh, I'm sorry. To, just uh, to follow up on that last point, uh, this is an issue on which I think the religious traditions have a particularly important contribution because so many of the impacts on us are very short term. The political process can't see beyond the next election, the economic process can't see beyond the next quarterly report. But the religious traditions have always had uh, an extension to many generations of their outlook. And that, that sustainability feature, I think, perhaps one needs to point out that specifically religious input into that issue. Right. Thank you. On the question of national sovereignty or sustainability, two very quick examples. A few decades ago, when the United States discovered we could produce green, produce rice, and ship it to Japan and sell it cheaper than Japanese produced rice, Japan put on high tariffs, which we screamed about. Japan had two arguments. First, we don't want to drive all our small rice farmers on the hillside out of business. And second, in the event of a war, we need to keep have local rice production so we can feed our people from locally produced food. Um, second example, a little bit the same spirit, Malawi, landlocked country in East Africa, where we discovered we could ship in maize, corn, and sell it cheaper than they could produce it locally. Of course, Malawi had no similar political leverage, didn't put on tariffs. We shipped in maize, drove a lot of local land out of maize production, and when we made the interesting political decision to produce ethanol from corn and the price rose, <laughs> the result was massive starvation in Malawi where the land could not, where you have basically pointed stick agriculture and the land could not be put back into production fast enough. Yeah, I, I mean, Malawi is also an interesting case because they also have not been that complacent. They've been very resistant actually of recent times to sort of taking back their own traditional food systems. Yeah, yeah you're, uh, I'm an anthropologist too, and when I became one, having been a chemist uh, uh, to begin with, I was completely enamored by culture, cultural uh, access, and so forth. So I want to take you to task and ask you what you really think about <laughs> cultural access, uh, because uh, access and influence, I think, are the uh, hallmarks of actually uh, uh, solving some of the food security issues. So for example, if we leave in the terms cultural access and cultural or custom and so forth, all we are doing is redefining the traditional distribution systems and the yes. traditional norms about who can eat and who can't and what food security means at the local levels. For example, I think we all know that the wealthy eat better than the poor in terms of quantity and diversity. I think we are beginning to realize some of the gender differences. I'm always amazed by the cultural restrictions on women, girls, pregnant women, uh, in terms of proteins. 
Um, they can't eat fish. They can't eat eggs. The boys get more proteins. I've seen it. I've seen the household distributions done by women, but uh, giving more to the men and uh, withholding for their, their daughters the protein and giving it to their sons, even uh, in so many cultures of the planet, especially those with sun preference all the time in the Middle East, much of Africa, and, and lots of other places. Uh, then sacred foods. When they put those gorgeous foods on their doorsteps, and then the masked men come out representing the ancestors, and the children are inside, and the women are inside, and they'll be whipped. Uh, and then what happens to the food? Strangely, it's gone the next day. All the young men in the village have eaten it. So, you know, access is a very, very interesting concept in this whole diagram of uh, whether it's being in, in a cultural tradition of whether we're maintaining it. So I know Catholic Living Services and a lot of these projects do a much better job than we want, might gather uh, from actually looking at yes. this chart. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know how sensitive they really are to uh, wealth and gender distinctions in food distribution. So you might want to comment on that. And one more thing. In terms of, I would say, a, a somewhat of a romance uh, about uh, uh, biodiversity in traditional societies and the number of uh, species and differences and so forth, I think that's a romance uh, because a lot of these societies were located in microecologies where things were also very seasonal. And I know people would tell me, you know, living in the villages and in some of the places I did live in, uh, that we can only eat this at this time, and it was only, it, it, there might be a glut at that time, or even an adequate supply, but it wasn't available the rest of the time. They might have 10 or 12 different varieties of maize or of cassava or manioc or something like that. Um, maybe it lasts longer days in the store with all the, the problems we discussed yesterday. But nevertheless, all the other fresh products that could not be stored uh, or left in the ground uh, were extremely, extremely seasonal. And they were only in that little microecology, even though the next microecology over would have other things. So, you know, on a worldwide basis, there was huge biodiversity. But for people localized in small areas, it was very, very narrow. Um, so I think we over romanticize that vision. So you might want to comment on this. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll work backwards quickly. I think, yeah, maybe over romanticize the degree of biodiversity. But I think it's important to realize that even in that micro, just that people have that and maintain that traditional knowledge of that small microecology system itself, I think is important in the context of where they're trying to be stripped away from it. Because it is their backup, particularly as a coping strategy. Uh, just quickly in terms of the, uh, when, in the emergency food world, I mean, they're moving heavily to thinking more about accountability. And I know all these reports have been coming out, you know, sort of after everything we want, uh, after Sudan, after this, and the Horn of Africa. It's been interesting because they keep pushing a lot that at the accountability has finally laid out very specific questions about you just can't talk to the leaders. When you talk about food distribution, you have to make sure that you speak with everyone. And my hope is that from that dialogue, at least for emergency food situations, that's going to translate into more longer term development projects, which will ask essentially the same kinds of questions. Who's being targeted? And are, are you, basically, are you really meeting the needs of the entire community? And, and that's, that's a hard transition to make. But I agree that that's been a more recent shift in terms of the way of thinking about all those people that we need to ask in this situation. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Could you identify yourself? Oh, and me just spray it just to my name type of yeah. <laughs> And and please. And identify yourself I'm too. Herb free. I just want to make what I hope will sound like a practical comment, a practical suggestion. In the context of your complicate for uh, spiritual size. Uh, assistance from the spiritual side. It seems to me you, we, anyone who feels like this requires all the help they can possibly get. And one would put other other uh, feelings aside for the moment, I think it would be useful to speak to the leaders of every major religious organization, certainly in this country and perhaps in the world. Uh, they have a certain amount of clout. 
And uh, especially if you're fighting corporate greed, you need some sort of clout, and some sort of clout that sounds righteous. And this would be, perhaps even for them, a useful thing to do. And so that is my suggestion. Go to the heads of the organized churches, uh, in fact, internationally, start with the Vatican if you want. But, but uh, do something in the long run, and it might be extremely useful. Thanks, Sam. I'm hoping that something can be done along those lines, even for the Farm Bill coming up, that we get a few of these discussions. Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you for such an informative talk. And um, I just wanted to connect a few dots that sort of as a new kid on the block, I'm a gold star. Um, I didn't realize some of the things that Saul pointed out yesterday and you also referred to where the tryptophan is such an important precursor for the niacin and the tryptophan is also necessary for serotonin. So if you're using your tryptophan for your niacin, are you going to be mentally able? Well, my, the short answer is the D and the four Ds is dementia and that's because of that. Well, I suspected that. And Exactly. And so what I'm wondering is, is, is the problem of obesity and the wrong food is in one category. And then let's say there's the right food, which might be the raw corn or the raw barley or the raw beans or the raw wheat or the raw rice. Without it having the recipe delivered, the recipe for offsetting the niacin problem with the, with the alkaline or the beans, or the soy, or all of the different things. Could the religions that are involved in the aid offer some ritualistic recipes that wouldn't involve education as much as, to, you know, do this. You have to make the food this way for a ritualistic reason. But within that ritual would be contained the correct way to treat the food so it can be nutritious. And I, I think people that do food aid are very, uh, thinking about that a lot in terms of global traditions. I mean, clearly, in Sub-Saharan Africa, a lot of maize is fermented, which gets you around the Adelaide like processing pretty quickly. So you, if you treat the same way you treat the traditional grains of organ, organ uh, sort of milk, sorry, you basically have, have a way to get around things like a lot. It is tapping into sort of using a different grain, but in the same way you've done traditionally, both in terms of ritual and other things. And is the, um, the oil shale that's probably going to replace the, uh, the biofuel with the corn. Is that going to create this glut of corn that's then going to be used to feed the world? So that need to treat the corn properly for nutrition is going to become even more important. Is there a week-long conference on hydrofracking next week? <laughs> that's a long conversation. Yeah. 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 Well, no, I, I think what will happen is in the way the corn market is, people will switch back to soybeans. When prices drop down, they'll find something else to do with that. Well, it'll be, it'll feed more animals, produce more beef, produce more meat for the increasing meat consumers of the world. That's what's going to happen to it. Okay. So we make it cheaper. Unfortunately. But. Edmund Robinson, uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Before I was a uh, minister, I was a lawyer, and the word sovereign to me, I want to critique it because I think it's important when we talk about human rights to try to get some terminology that will last and will really define the real <laughs> problems. Um, and sovereign, to me, is the uh, agency aspect of a nation state. Uh, the ownership and the right, uh, the, the set of rights that occur originally the king. The, the, yeah, the, the top, the same yeah. uh, So, you know, it seems to me that when you're using food sovereignty, you're talking about some of that, and some of these, uh, the Malawi example is a pretty good example, uh, sort of the way that, that the uh, uh, Pakistan complains about U.S. drone strikes in their territory. That's, they're invading our sovereignty, what would be the complaint. So, in that sense, but, but with, with food politics, it seems to me that some national groups can also complain that their power over their own food is being taken away from them. Why is it about corporations often instead of national policy? So it seems to me a more general term might be autonomy, food autonomy, love and food sovereignty, and a little less confusing. Just a suggestion. Yeah. Well, Matt, I think the reason this peasant movement, the farmers, small farmers, came up with sovereignty is 
to actually to rise that as a brittle. Basically, have people start talking about this notion of nation-state sovereignty, of sovereignty of small farmers on the same, you know, putting themselves at the same level of being like a nation-state, being able to make those kind of decisions and having those kinds of rights. But I, I, I agree. It's the same thing. I know Ellen will probably clarify tonight a lot of this question of food rights. The notion of rights is getting into that same kind of legalistic question as well. Which I think she'll, she'll it's like ethnovore. Any new neologism can't open up a great uh, uh, new vista, but it also can obscure it. I agree. My name is Paul Carr. Uh, my question, uh, I'd like to suggest, uh, my question is, is, is it possible to add to your rights the right of truth and advertising? You know, well, this is the big issue in the United States and any developed country, because I think a lot of our food patterns are really determined, well, the average person is determined by advertising. I mean, there are laws that try to curb that. I guess uh, the corporation would say that our advertising is truth. It's the interpretation of that truth. And that's how could it be enforced? I think that's the key. Exactly. I think that would be a job for the Food and Drug Administration, really. I agree. And then obviously the problem with food production, you have the EPA, the Food and Drug Administration, and the Department of Agriculture all overseeing different aspects of that, and that's where it gets a little tricky. But, uh, I agree. It's identified. Yeah. I'm Roger Brown. Um, I was struck by your comment and Saul's about the the value of the local farmer, the local uh, having control over their food, being able sometimes to grow 50% of their own. Um, and But there's an awful lot of movement of people into the cities. There are, the cities are in existence. Um, I was, um, was recently in China where I actually was in a region um, where there, there's a lot of farming in every little possible available inch. But then I read in the New York Times a few weeks ago, the government wants to move in 10 years 250 million people into the cities. Um, and that seems very alarming. They're already moving the people off the Tibetan grasslands, people who know how to make a, make a life. Uh, and they, not only know about the China situation, but the governmental organization stresses uh, in this way seem yeah, and that's, that's another long conversation because if you look in the case of, of China, I mean, where are the super producers going? Who's going to make that up? Is it going to be going to follow industrial food model in terms of production? Or as we know, what's happening, the food production is going to be taking place in sub-Saharan Africa and in Brazil to, to make up for those people going into the cities, into the factories at the same time. They're basically going to be imported by uh, land grabbing the parts of the Demi Miller, and I'm looking at the, the way to incorporate sustainability into this model that seems to be around the area of accountability. Uh, no accountant would dare present a legitimate budget in which the capital budget and mix were mixed with the expenditures and income budgets, uh, and every good capitalist is trying to do exactly that. And the global corporations are all about externalizing costs, which means consuming natural capital, social capital, human and spiritual capital, and calling it income. So the, what we need is, is real uh, integrity in accounting, in accounting and accounting that can stand up against the corporations and keep pointing out that these are real capital stocks and they can't be converted to income and put down in the bottom line. Yeah, just use the term asset to get you right down that path. Well, I mean, just by 
def definition would be those things that would be edible and packaged. So I'm assuming it's going to be probably things like crackers, shelf staple things, crackers, cookies, canned things of all sorts. Uh, but and they basically include anything in the grocery store that's shelf stable. They would include in that sort of thing, yes. But I, 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 I agree that it'd be worth sort of getting on the ground. That's not just the corn soy blend that the um, that the Millers spent, the Millers and these these big international grain trading firms spent a lot of food processors spent a lot of money lobbying for. No, no, no this is okay. all the other okay. stuff you find on the shelf. Okay. All right. Then the general question is that really wonderful final example you gave us of the Brazilian community of former forced laborers who had been assisted by the Catholic institutions and also the Catholic institutions. I know from our conversation yesterday at lunch, we're also working with government to try to form these programs. Um, what, we, what, what I continue to see in Brazil, and I'll be presenting a Brazil case study tonight also, is that there's this wonderful, really very fluid interaction between civil society organizations, including many of the church organizations, and government programs. And the question that I raise very basically for us to be thinking about here are whether the, the institutions of government, which are the, particularly the right, those that come under the right to food, the kinds of food programs uh, of, of various sorts of, of helping people become more self-reliant or helping those who can't be self-reliant nevertheless fulfill their right to food, those are filling the gaps that are left from community process because ideally, Every household, every community is self-reliant. So government's trying to, to fill those, those gaps that are also then more, uh, left by the local organizations that are trying to help those who are not self-reliant. On the other hand, the um, local organizations are trying to also then reciprocally fill the gaps that are left by government programs. So the, the basic, the underlying essential question that, that some of us have is whether um, these are best left as independent institutions or whether um, they really should be working more closely in coordination. How, how, do, how do these dynamics and the interrelationships between the public and the private work themselves out? And I'm sure you've been thinking about that as someone who's there from the perspective mm -hmm. of the Catholic institutions, but also thinking about the public Right. That sounds like a lot of good conversation. <laughs> I'll, I'll just say, I'll, I'll bring that up in the context of our own farm bill, and then we'll right at that point. But those that really want that nutrition bill separated out, is they want, you could say, the slack or the responsibility being put on civil society and not on the federal government. And I think that's the same would be true in Brazil. That same kind of debate goes back and forth about the role of the government. So, but I think, again, civil society or these organizations are just trying to bridge the gap all the time. With a change in sort of shifting sand. Well, I was curious as to whether there's been an expansion, certainly uh, in labeling foods. We've decided to label them organic, not organic. There is also a movement of not only what is raised, but the process of raising it. And other than, let's say, free trade coffee. Are there other movements so that we could understand by you know, labeling of whether we are contributing to the injustice? I mean, off the top of my head, I, I don't know the exact names in, but I mean, there are definitely different products that we say, you know, done by for animal products, the ethics of that. And then different states and different sort of organizations have come up with their own labels that people look for. And I mean, you don't have to talk ahead some of those names, but some of you probably know in the audience that will say whether. It's been the stamp of approval, not from the federal government, but it's from these autonomous, respected organizations who basically put the stamp of approval that it's been raised ethically, for example, or for example, it's been raised in a sustainable food system, for example, uh, as well. And that, a, lot, a lot of people actually prefer more stricter organic standards, for example, like in the state of Oregon, because they're more stricter than USDA. So some people don't, even by USDA, they would further standardization, they would further stamp of approval. That, that, that is a growing movement now, sort of the ethics of food and what's coming from. Hi, I'm Mark Cooper, John. I came in late. I don't know if you've addressed this already, but um, regarding the recent Supreme Court decision, which uh, either gives or reinforces a corporation's rights similar to uh, an individual, 
Um, can you comment on to what extent that is either going to help or hinder any attempts to improve the, um, the food industry? I mean, my short answer is I don't think it's been a Supreme Court decision in the last 10 years that that's been to the advantage of the personal consumer. That's, <laughs> that's that <laughs> Sorry, I put it off that way. That is really a preface to my question. I'm Charlotte Brewer, I'm a Unitarian, and we did have a couple of years to really talk about ethical eating, so I've been paying some attention. And I'm just wondering, is it possible for religious organizations to help all of us stand up to the kinds of decisions that the Supreme Court has made. I mean, they left the Monsanto um, seed users. They, that was the decision that was made. And now, how do we help these corporations, how do we make them become more responsible? And we are the other circle of responsibility. Is it through our religions that? We can best be led. Well, I think someone said, said it earlier that there's, there's great power, of course, in faith communities that come together on a certain action about things. But I think we're still waiting for that to happen. I mean, so it's the purpose of this. Yeah, I'm a, I mean, I think saw you know, creating, as, as a group, creating kind of this declaration, I guess, is trying to is sort of frame that, that out. But I mean, there are different national movements, you know, like the, uh, I know that, for example, the, the National Catholic Rural Life Center. Uh, when, when I get their email newsletter, there, there's these amazing networks of, of interfaith groups that are doing food issues that basically try to get individuals to, to write their comments from like some of the farm bill and things like that. But I, I agree there needs to be much more, let's say, persuasive lobbying uh, power that helps the lobbying power is difficult to come by without the great money you have to have in DC. Change the focus a little bit. Um, there's a long tradition in Latin America of the liberation theology based communities, and some of that new community seems to have some of the characteristics of some of the maybe not so political characteristics of the based community. Oh, it did. Is it yes. out of that tradition? Absolutely, yeah. So there's, there's been some discussion whether Pope Francis has some, um, shall we say, at least tolerance for the. the um, Liberation theology in Latin America is, is can we expect to see more of this kind of? Um... <laughs> I, I think there will be much more open discussion about the spirit of liberation theology and its original sort of formation, more radicalization of it. I think it definitely will continue to not give a stamp of approval. But I think when it's translated into things like these kinds of actions, that's where you see sort of support. I don't want to say it's kind of a roundabout support, but in the spirit of these kinds of movements and sort of involving the peasant populations, I think we have much more open discussion about that. And I think that's what everyone's hoping for. So, thank you. Thanks. All right, it's time for the photo. Everybody out front. <laughs> thank you.